Hey, why don't I welcome to the stage, to the virtual stage, uh, the Live Ops Landscape Track Sponsor, Microsoft. We've got Mark Val here to do a superstar session uh, about Live Ops. Mark, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Thank Perfect. You hey, hey, thank you. Well, look, I'm going to fade into the background. Just a reminder to everyone watching this track, if you have questions for Mark, please uh, pop them in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll keep an eye on those. And at the end of the uh, at the end of your talk, Mark, I can pop up and help you curate those if you like. But uh, in the meantime, I'll vanish into the background. And uh, yeah, uh, let's start the afternoon sessions with a round of applause for Mr. Mark Fowle. Thank you. Um, cool. All right. So thank you, Dave. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, so my, my name is Mark Val. So I'm part of the um, uh, Microsoft Azure PlayFab team. Uh, so I'm part of the original team of PlayFab. I've been in the online industry for a bit more than 20 years. And I've spent the last 10 years, as you're seeing now, uh, touring studios all around the world, talking about live game operation. So I've seen all the goods and the bads. So I'm gonna try to share a few things to this uh, presentation. Um, so a few words about uh, Azure Play Fabs. We're now at 1 billion unique monthly active users across thousands of games. And as you see now, we're also um, making it available for you to have game services to power your game and also a content management system with a GUI for your team to work on. And that way you can build and operate and grow your game to uh, succeed in the gaming industry. Um, so to start with um, a little quick view about what we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna go a little bit about uh, before live games and what, what, a, what it was, but also what you can also see today uh, that is interesting best practices and then um, uh, we're going to close uh, the presentation after. So mainly what you have to keep in mind is that dialogue and iteration is key to succeed inside of uh, live game operation and we're going to see more about that in this uh, presentation obviously. So um, the whole goal of live ops is to interact with the audience. Um, and uh, there's so many books that were written in the past uh, before or now actually I got updated uh, more toward data wise, but there's a lot, there's loads of content about operations per se, which is how to retain, grow, and, um, and then convert your customers to payers. And um, as through the industry we've been through and entertainment, there's a lot of things that uh, are still valid today. And uh, as we move into the augmented age where Everyone has their mobile phone in their pocket, but also with the glasses that are up and coming, um, live data feed are going to get much more important. And um, we're going to see even more subset of the live game operation or live operation, not only in gaming, but also outside in the B2B sectors. So that said, um, um, if, you, if you look at day-to-day -day stuff, um, um, I'll say that uh, summer camps is a very good example of live operation where you have um, a crowd of kids that comes and uh, that wakes up in the morning and are looking forward to have a good day. Uh, they're ready to earn their badges and they're ready to have fun with their friends and um, go back to bed at night with full of stories in their mind and ready to go the next day. And overall, it's really about nurturing the the, the kids so that they grow up but also learn a lot of things while having fun. And there's many books about how to manage summer camps that are 100% applicable to live games. And um, uh, so I suggest you to look in this direction to have more information. And definitely, the, if you look at summer camps, the, the goal is, to, is for the, these kids to come back year after year as they grow up. And obviously, since they the, the next year that they come, they're one year older, then they, the content has to change and the seasons has to change and the teams has to change. So there's a lot to be learned in there. But also if you look in the, um, um, uh, for restaurants or bars or clubs, this is exactly the same thing where you have an area where people, when they come in, they kind of know what's going to happen. And then there's the food, there's the service, there's the ambience. And, um, and there's a lot to be learned also uh, in outside of the gaming industry about how to actually give services to your customers in a proper way. And a good example is restaurants that will make sure to identify new customers. And when, the, uh, when they receive the bill at the end of the day or at the end of their uh, dinner, 
well, they're going to have a rebate for the next time that they come or maybe a free cake or a free something so that they make sure that they retain that customers. Or maybe if they bring someone else, they have two for one free. So there's good ways to grow your crowd until you reach a certain um, level uh, of quality and then you can raise your price afterwards. So there's many books about that as well. They're super interesting. But let's keep it to data and games. Uh, so we're going to cover business, the teams, and strategies, and how to execute on top of that. So to start with, so the first question you have to ask yourself to really succeed in the, with LiveOps is how will you monetize? Uh, too many teams forget this key factor. Uh, of course, you can have a really good story, a good game. Uh, but how it will monetize is hugely important. That's where your business can start. That's where you're going to forecast everything. So you have to have a good, um, a good understanding uh, about where you're going to go. If you want to monetize with ads or if you want to monetize with virtual goods or with premium content or with merchandising, with IP, it's totally different. It's a different stack. It's a different way to understand what you need for ads. Um, the vast majority of developers forget that how they're going to make money is not with the game per se, but it's with the players slash users that they're going to sell to the uh, RTB platform or to the publishers. And the value of the crowd that they attract to their game is what will actually make capitalize uh, for making money afterwards. Same thing for virtual goods. What would be the point where someone's going to do is their first payment? Uh, is it a subscription? Is it because they filled out uh, a bank of virtual currencies and you cannot spend it until they do, they unlock something with payment? Um, so defining where is going to be the first place where a player slash user is going to spend some money is uh, very much important. And regarding premium content, and content is making sure you have something unique that people really want to buy. You can still have a free to play game and have later down the line some premium content. Um, or you, what we have seen in the past is uh, games that um, uh, that were that you could buy premium content from the start, where you can go from level zero to fifty very quickly. And now this is changing in a trend where um, it's actual content where you have to make a journey of two three weeks, and instead of taking like a year to get to level fifty, it's going to be two three weeks to get there. But at least you can have some content that goes with it that is very interesting. And obviously having a high P. Uh, if you can get in that uh, uh, in that sector, um, making merchandising is uh, primordial. That is in line with your game. Um, uh, many IPs uh, are doesn't have yet a game content that are on the shelf uh, for kids or for anyone actually to buy. And um, uh, merchandising is often put on the side and forgotten. It's more complicated. It's not digital, of course but there's a lot of uh, opportunities in that space and uh, much more today since the new users are very hard to find and you have to divert to find other verticals to monetize your crowd. So uh, there's good books to get you started uh, in this direction. Uh, if you have no clue of what I've just talked about, so I would suggest you go into something that is more general uh, with the first book and, um, and then you can go down the line about optimizing either by A-B testing or by which price you should put first, what is your specials, how to influence uh, in advertising for growing your game. There's a lot of content in these three books to get you started and move forward. So that said, um, if once you have to choose which monetization strategy you're going to put in place, it's extremely important that you align all of your team together. If you have some people that are uh, trying to think about the end game before actually figuring out how this thing will make money, uh, it, it won't go well. There's a 100% chance that this is going to fail. Either you're going to go into too much details before validating what you're doing. And the key here is really to release the, the game as soon as possible so that you can iterate very fast. Um, so you iterate uh, in certain country, you soft launch very soon. You, know, you spend six months in soft launch if required to make sure that your KPI are correct, that you distinguish yourself uh, from the other apps. But still, it's really about the team that has to line, iterate, and accelerate. Once you have found out what is the golden nugget of what you're building, then you can accelerate and actually grow in more countries, start to localize and whatnot. And there, you're going to have some much more success. Um, 
there's another good book to get you started into your uh, leadership scenario. And, uh, um, and uh, this book has been there for a while. It's made by uh, actually someone from the army. And um, <laughs> uh, it, it, every single tip that is in this book can apply to the uh, gaming industry. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of analogies to be made. Uh, but you will get your uh, team and yourself, if you're C-levels, uh, more in line into uh, where to get to the goal, to the end goal. Um, so obviously after that comes a strategy. Um, many, just too many studios uh, target right away per user from the start. This is wrong. Uh, you should not A-B test right away. You should segment instead uh, to try to prioritize your top level KPIs. Obviously, if you have a game that has good engagement or that has good growth or that uh, monetize very quickly, you just need one of those to have a successful game. If you have two or three of those, then you have one of those one hit timer of the season. And hopefully you're gonna be able to keep your players so that last many years and be successful for a very long time. Um, so um, when I say that you should not target the user, it's really because you have to take a holistic view of all the, you know, the, all the global players there is on this planet. So currently there's 2.3 billion players and um, uh, it's better to target all of them at the same time and making sure that your game is fun before trying to optimize some other parts of the game. And obviously if you go in the ad sector versus uh, having something that is more based on, on player, uh, on the virtual goods, then the time span in the game will be different. Uh, so targeting and making sure you have good uh, behavioral strategies and then all going all the way down to optimize the, the end user with machine learning. Uh, and then after that, really optimize on colors, buttons and words um, is, is really a key way for you to, uh, to succeed. And again, there's a bunch of books that's gonna help you out to uh, really get you um, uh, uh, with good, should I say, understanding on how to get there. Um, each of those books are very pertinent. Uh, some are more uh, generic, uh, but still, uh, once you go through them, uh, you're going to have better understanding of how to apply. And definitely, if you reach the path of going of diving into psychology or behaviors, then get someone in your team for, with a university degree in that field. Don't try to debunk it yourself. Uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge to be done to be uh, to to master the skills. And eventually you're gonna be able to make some form and questionnaire for your players and the community to engage uh, to, to go forward. And don't be afraid to let your game go and be controlled by the community, giving leadership to moderators that are part of the community and whatnot. So that way, obviously it's gonna create more waves for uh, the players that are playing with them. And, um, and then obviously you're gonna retain a lot more. And um, uh, all of this cannot be done without tools. Um, if you don't have the right tools at the right time, it, it is very hard to, uh, to go forward. Uh, just too many games are launched with just the bare minimum, and then they are stuck in technical debt. Uh, we had a panel earlier today, and um, uh, we had good examples about that. And um, so uh, technical debt is, is a killer. Uh, you cannot launch a game uh, without your in-game shop, if you go in virtual goods, uh, you cannot uh, go with ads without a full understanding of your crowd, uh, how much are they earning, uh, their psycho traits, and um, so because otherwise you cannot optimize your uh, your reach afterwards. And um, having a full pipeline where your client uh, can be data medically updated from the back end is is extremely necessary. Um, so that way you're going to be able to show different content afterwards based on segmentation to the users, uh, having a pipeline that does the whole versioning in a way that makes it uh, easy for you to, uh, to really propose the right content to the users, uh, but also um, the two squares that we're seeing on the left row, administration, having a good planning tool is, is essential as well. So in your planning tool, you should be able to uh, have a full backlog of what's up and coming have all the crash logs and, um, uh, and also, also having all of the uh, analytic trend of the game regarding either if it's in virtual guns again, uh, what are the money sinks, uh, where there is too much money, which level players are stuck the most and uh, how you can 
make them advance uh, per, uh, per group of players if they're stuck somewhere, uh, culturally understand where, where, where they are and what they like uh, is uh, very important. I think the cloud save and being cross-platform is more and more popular. Um, the players now really likes to go from one device to another and continue the experience. So I, just, I suggest to investigate that part. And uh, obviously to have a tool that is bulletproof so that when your players are starting to share and bring their friends on board uh, to make sure that it can scale up or horizontally uh, so that you can continue give it, to give the best service to your uh, players is essential to, uh, to go forward. And um, so there's many tools that you have to keep in mind that are used to uh, forecast what the players and the users will want. So by any means, you're gonna work in the future. So it means that the current content that you're gonna work with is actually something that's gonna get released in three weeks or maybe in three months from now. You have to figure out the right cadence to be able to push it out. And um, uh, obviously optimizing uh, is key to your success. Uh, you first, as I was saying earlier, you first have to aim into having a good retention and after that, having uh, good growth and obviously having a good conversation to pair. And then afterwards, uh, once all of that is working pretty well, you can start your, your UA campaign. And um, uh, if that's the strategy you have and uh, being able to, uh, uh, to bring uh, the whole crowd much, much, much further. Um, so obviously there's uh, many tools that can uh, help you with that. Uh, so for us, as you saw earlier in the little video, uh, Microsoft Game Stack is really meant to uh, help you to do all of that. Um, Azure Play Fab has all the backend tools to help you to operate and grow your games and uh, all the backend services for your leaderboards, to making tournaments and um, actually building your live up events. And obviously at Microsoft, we have all the planning tools to get you forward with that and the versioning system to help you out to uh, actually achieve these things. But no matter the tools that you're using, if you don't understand what you're doing, if your team is not aligned, if you don't have uh, goals that are set there and, the, and KPIs that you can actually reach, um, you should never say to your team, okay, let's just make better retention. No, you have to aim for a number and try to, to go in that direction. So following OKRs, um, that way you're gonna be able to achieve uh, greatness, uh, hopefully. So um, uh, obviously when you meet a lot of studios, you hear a lot of good and bad stories, but uh, in short, you have to keep the dialogue inside of your team. You have to keep the dialogue with your players, get the feedback from your customer support agents, from your community managers, and um, get the feedback also from your data analysis uh, and data scientists and your eventually your um, uh, psycho traits uh, professional inside of your team so that you can iterate better and obviously succeed to uh, uh, be able to get more users or simply to uh, get more content for them to be happy. So uh, that, was, that was very short. All of these slides can be explained in, in more than an hour to, uh, to get into really in the nuts and bolts and how it works. Uh, but um, I hope that was interesting for you today and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mark. That's great. Let me fade back into view here. Um, really good, really good uh, introduction and um, uh, an overview of, uh, of live ops and the tools that you need. Um, really appreciate the reading list as well. I was frantically taking notes of books I need to, to get hold of. And um, that, that was it's great. And, and it's recorded, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is recorded. So people will be able to, to watch that back. That's great. So look, we've actually, we've got a, um, we've actually got a few minutes till our next speaker is ready. And there were, there are seven questions in the book, more than that. Wow. People are asking questions. So what I'll do, uh, uh, Mark, I'll just read some of these questions out so that everyone can hear them. And uh, hopefully this will, um, there'll be some answers in here that will be relevant for everyone. So, um, yeah, definitely. Yes, cool. Definitely. So the first question, uh, an anonymous one says a lot of, a lot of developers focus on UA and retention uh, as a fully data driven task. And it's great that you're talking about player psychology. Uh, I agree. That was very interesting. So in your opinion, what is the best way to connect with you, connect with the users for UA and retention? Yeah. So, um, so there's two things. So before thinking about UA, you should give incentives to the player to uh, gather their friends on board. Um, so growing your user base doesn't necessarily mean you have to do user acquisition. There is multiple techniques. Uh, 
uh, that we that you can leverage your current crowd to uh, maximize their uh, engagements with their people around them or if they are part of communities to get those communities to uh, uh, at least try your game so then regarding uh, user acquisition per se uh, you should not actually uh, start any ua campaign uh, before you have your old pipeline regarding analytics so you need to know exactly what you're looking for so if you want to bring players to uh, engage more with your community that's one way so you can go in ua in that direction you can do user acquisition to get players that will monetize in your game that's another uh, type of user acquisition and then the third one is really players that um, uh, will not only do the the tutors but also can uh, influence the game so they will participate in the in the community and bring feedback on um, so user acquisition is often only seen in the business wise only to bring money back but often users that you uh, that you get will do other things so you have to be able to uh, track those group of users so in the future you when you actually need to gather these type of users you can uh, actually spend either more money or less money and that's eventually what you're looking for to get those players on board and um, user acquisition doesn't have to be through other mobile games it can be through uh, Facebook, it can be through ads on Google AdWords, it doesn't matter. So you have to try everything to really find out which uh, group are going to attract and then the behaviors that they have on top of them. Each of the source that you're going to get will give you players with different behaviors. So I highly suggest to really have this whole tree of uh, possibilities for you. No, that, that's great. And actually, just um, going on from there, the next question was, uh, for indie developers, and I guess with indie developers, often their budgets and team budgets and team are smaller. So for an indie developer, what is easier to focus on? Is it engagement, growth, uh, paying customers? What do you think? Yeah. So um, for any indies that start today, you um, have to you have to release your game as soon as possible and get something that is actually fun. You don't have, you shouldn't think about user acquisition and all these things because your goal is to try to create something that is unique. Or if you want to actually go in the same vertical as other genre, or if you want to mix up genre together, uh, it's really to nail down the fun of the game. Because what you have to first um, do is actually uh, raise your hand and say, hey, hey, I'm here and actually have good stuff and then get good reviews. So the reviews is probably the place where you're gonna get the most users from the get-go and as you get the more uh, and as the crowd grow you should not forget if you make like a mobile game the money that you're going to get from the stores are going to get into your bank account three months after it started to uh, to be spent so uh, so you need some sort of a war chest to even consider ua at the start mm. obviously if you have publishers that invest money inside of your uh, IP or your studio that can be easier but you should burn money in actually uh, flexing your muscles and keeping your players and uh, making sure that they do a bit of virality between them so that you can get that ball rolling and, um, and eventually you're gonna get to success doing UA in the battle we're in today there's very big players that spends millions of dollars on those every day uh, you cannot compete with them. So you have to be original and really distinguish yourself with uniqueness. That's a very good point. And you know what? I think the, the next question here kind of preempted what you were saying there. So the next person says, should developers try to achieve a viral game, for example, Fall Guys, that, that kind of blows up, or aim for a long-lasting game? Um, an interesting sort of tag to the end of this question is, is that even something developers can control? <laughs> well, um... It's all about luck, okay? Um, you you don't know uh, you don't know what's going to happen with your game, um, so you you should not aim for virality. You should not aim for um, LTV on three years from the get go because you just don't know. Um, and um, so what I suggest there very much is to when you're going to release your game 
is to at least have 31 days of content. Um, usually, um, what, here's what's going to happen is that if you have virtual goods and not so much ads, so you're more tailoring on vir virtual goods, is that the big spenders starts paying after 31 days. So it means you need, you need to focus on the content itself. So having 31 days of content just to soft launch on the start is fine, but you have to go quickly to have three months to six months of content, either by taking your game mechanic and making it harder just by adding new, you know, new features on top of it. But essentially, it's really to get to that form and factor where you can both understand what's happening on day one with the payers that space very quick and also with the long tail of your players. Um, where after 31 days, they're going to start to spend a lot of money. Um, so that, that's, the, that, that's something to keep in mind. But again, as I was saying at the start, it's very much about luck. So you should not, you should not try to focus and say, hey, I'm going to make a viral game. Uh, you can obviously go into making user-generated content. Uh, you're going to see more and more of those. And for us at PlayFab, we're about to uh, release publicly a new game features that uh, is going to be available for all of you to create UGC content for your players. But because um, uh, here's the thing is that it comes in waves. What was popular two years ago is not so much popular now. But this uniqueness I was talking about earlier is really what makes it um, uh, over everything else. And um, so UGC is, uh, uh, so the users themselves are more mature than a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So now people are more uh, understanding what needs to be done and also the generation change. Uh, they want to be seen, they want to have stars, they want to be part of leaderboards, but also uh, have friends with them, around them. So the dopamine takes in at this moment. Um, so uh, if you can have emotional triggers that will bring those satisfaction of a feeling that you accomplish something very quickly, uh, then there's a very high chance these people are going to come back to get that same feeling again and again and again. So, um, so yeah, uh, there, there's no, there's no really a secret except really being passionate about what you're doing and really sit, really sit as soon as you can. That's great advice. That's great advice. But do you know what? Um, there's actually, there's a few more questions here, but we are out of time and I've been told our next speaker is here. It's 2.30 already. So I think what we'll do is uh, we'll have to leave it there. I'll grab those questions and put them, maybe I can put them to you um, separately and we can do something on them and later. And if anyone does have questions for you about Microsoft's tools, can they find you in uh, the Meet to Match platform or in Discord? What's the best way uh, to get in touch? Yeah, with I'm on the Meet to Match platform. I'm also in the Live Ops channel right now. Great. The Discord app, so you're welcome to come. Uh, otherwise, you can find my email also in the Meet to Match system. So feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to spend some time and maybe to do a, a dissection of what you're looking for to do. Perfect. That sounds great. And yes, um, if, if people do want to catch up with you now in Discord, there's a, a big button on Meet to Match that'll take you straight through to the um, Meet to Discord uh, section. Then look under the Live Ops landscape and you'll be able to find uh, Mark in there. So look, thank you very much. I'm going to give you a round of applause. You'll have to imagine yes, it coming from everyone else. It's the... Uh, the